Welcome back to the Milwaukee Market Update. We're covering real estate news and data, breaking it down to help you understand how it impacts your real estate decisions. Teaser, in this episode, are 6% interest rates the new norm? Here's what we wanna take, take away from this episode. What's going on with inventory and home prices at a national level? How do you write a winning offer as a buyer? Are you working with the right lender? And also, does Southwest reimburse golf clubs that they run over? And don't forget, why are people coming to and leaving Wisconsin? All right, then let's uh, let's dive into our quick tips. Nick, I know you got a buyer tip for this month. Yeah, my quick tip this month is relating to buyers in the pre-approval phase. So I have a twin sister. She is purchasing a condo in Chicago right now. Ooh. Yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> Not as competitive as Milwaukee, right? but um, I think it's very important to have a lender that's responsive and that is able to turn pre-approvals for you quickly. Mm -hmm. And you can find that out right away working with a lender if they are responsive or not. And if you have any questions on the correct lender to use, um, we have a lot of contacts in that space that are good lenders. Yeah. And there's a difference between a lender at a large bank like a Chase or a Wells Fargo versus a loan officer at a local bank and just what they can provide to you. Um, and so she was in a situation where her pre-approval was only up to a certain amount. Mm -hmm. She wanted to put an offer in above that amount, that amount, uh, and then was in this waiting phase where she requested an updated pre-approval from her lender. They got that back to her 48 hours later. By that point, there was already an accepted offer on the property. And you do yep. not, as a buyer, want to miss out on something because you're waiting for someone. Um, so I just think it's very important as you're doing your home search, as you're starting that process, to be sure that you're working with the right lender, and your pre-approval is all lined up. Yeah. Responsiveness, responsiveness is huge. But then also, if they're not asking you a lot of very personal questions like how much you make, how much money do you have, what like getting your credit pulled, they're not asking enough questions to actually give you the full-blown underwritten pre-approval. So those are normal questions. If they haven't asked you that, you might have a pre-approval letter that's not even at the value. And I've had that happen too before where we were shopping at a price, found the perfect home, and the lender didn't do their full job. And it oh, was wow. not one of those, you know, well-trusted, great responsive lenders that we typically work with. Good tip. Yeah, that's definitely nothing's yeah. worse than like having your dreams crushed. Right. And yeah. not having a lender that is as responsive as your real estate agent is. Um, on the home seller side, we've got my biggest tip, I'd say, that I've seen be super successful for homeowners when they go to list their home is like a home one pager of all the information of, you know, obviously some of the stuff you can find the MLS, like the year it's built, but some of those nuances of how old's the roof, how old are mechanicals, like the AC, the furnace, what are the upgrades you've made, maybe who the contractors were that did it. Because when you hand it off to the next person, you've just, uh, you know, kind of created a legacy document for that next person. And in this market where people are willing to really soften up contingencies and unfortunately sometimes waive them, you can really encourage the highest and best offers if you just show that you've been a really well-organized homeowner. So we actually have a template we can share out if you reach out to info at houseworkscollective.com. In the subject of just put in homeowner one page template and we'll shoot something over to you just so you can start getting that organized. I know as always, we always wanna do one little tip for uh, new investors as well. I'll let you kind of rip off this. I think the most important thing I've seen in an inventory environment where duplex inventory in our market's down 60% is that relationships are the most important. What's the best way to actually build relationships with not just agents, but with you know people in that investment space? I think with relationships, and I agree with you completely mm -hmm. because yeah. in the market we're in now for duplexes, there's mm -hmm. things on the MLS, things mm -hmm. are listed for sale. There's deals to be found out there for sure, but the best deals are ones that you can find off market yeah. where there's no competition, um, or a lot less competition. You could even get it at a better price, but off market deals aren't just something that falls in your lap. Right. Um, and with any relationship, you get out of it what you put into it. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you're someone looking to invest, buy a duplex, buy an off market property, working with a real estate agent that has connections in that, mm -hmm. but also networking with other wholesalers, lenders, um, people in the finance space yep. that have access to those and being present for them, giving something to them, staying top of mind for them is how you're going to be top of mind in return when those things come up that are off market potentially. Yeah. And, and there's nothing better, no better way to build a relationship than doing something in person. In my personal opinion, like there's meetups, there's ways that, you know, get people out, you know, buy their coffee, buy their lunch, whatever, like 
business actually ha starts happening and unfolds when you can get belly to belly and actually build a personal relationship. I know for us and our team, like if we have people that are frequently at our meetups and giving back to our mm -hmm. community, yeah, they're going to be the first ones that we ping when we've got like a really great off market opportunity that that's going to be a win win for the, the seller yep. as well as the buyer. Well, it's also like the clients that I work with, we get access being agents to off market deals. The people mm -hmm. I'm sending those to are the ones that put the most in the relationship. Yeah. And because I know that they have put their best foot forward to work with me. They're mm -hmm. committed to working with me and I in returning and committed to giving them the best deals that I could find. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's not always we have off market deals that pop up, but whenever they do, we're thinking about the people that put the most into the relationship because we want to put the most into that relationship as well. Yeah. It's a two way street for sure. So that kind of wraps up a couple tips that we got for this month. <clears throat> now we'll dive into our uh, local MLS stats and uh, obtained through the MLS data, starting with residential homes in the Milwaukee greater area. That's the four county area. New listings, 1,400 homes, down 19, almost down 20% to a year ago. Probably the number one stat line that we'll probably mention a little bit more. Uh, pending sales, 530 homes, up 3%. Closed sales, 1,000 homes, down 28% to a year ago. Days on market, 27 days, the exact same as last year. Median sales price, $300,000, nearly up 8%. A uh, little bit of a slowdown from the last two months, but you know, really what we saw is up 10, up 11, up 8. Home prices, you know, in terms of growing, has not slowed. Average sales price, 356000 up 7. Percent of original list price received, 100% as opposed to 102.3% a year ago. So... I do think that there's uh, some stuff to look under the covers there of we're definitely seeing a lot of homes go well above asking. There's definitely going to be some of those underlying things, maybe some of the old inventory that's dragging that number down because you're going to want to definitely look not even at just the metro area, but at each of your individual neighborhoods and localized spots in the market to see what that looks like in each sub market. Inventory of homes available, 1,900 homes down 11%. We've you know continued to see this at right around down to 10 to down 15%. And months supply of inventory, 2.0, as opposed to 1.6 last year when we were incredibly unhealthy. Again, we would really love to see that number be above four months of supply, sitting at about a half as much inventory as what we truly need. So again, I kind of mentioned already, new listings has got to be something we talk about. That's probably like the number one thing that people are focusing on on interest rates are so high, affordability is not great. Why the heck can't these prices come down? What are you seeing out there for new listings? Yeah, I, I think it's still a similar story to the last couple of months that we've seen where there people have this lock in effect. I think I saw that 70% of homeowners in Wisconsin are at a three and a half percent interest rate or better. Yeah. And so right there, it's, I think that is the reason we're not seeing the new listing inventory like we have historically, but new listings down 20% year over year. That's leading to now closed sales down 28% year mm -hmm. over year. And so listings is a leading indicator. Closed sales are a lagging indicator. Yep. Um, what is good to see is that new listings have picked up month over month over month, which mm -hmm. means that there is more inventory hitting the market this month than there was last month, which is just yeah. part of being in Wisconsin and the seasonality that right. no one wants to sell their home in the winter. Um, to me, though, what's also interesting is the inventory of homes for sale has basically flatlined. Yeah. Um, and so even though we're seeing new listing activity picking up, inventory for sale is pretty much the same as it's been the pretty last five, one six in. months. Yeah, one in, one out. And, and on this new listing side, I think the biggest thing I want to point out is you know, down 20% is like, oh, that's that's fine. Down 20%, like, it's not great, but it doesn't, like, make my stomach hurt or, like, get really nervous until you compare it to, like, a more, uh, you know, normalized year of what we saw pre-COVID. Typically, what we saw in the month of March in terms of new listings coming to the market in the Milwaukee local area was about 2,500, and we just listed 1,400 last, last month this year. Mm -hmm. That's down 40%. That's you know, getting, you know, definitely into the uncomfortable territory of what should really be happening to actually play some catch up in already low inventory, flat lining, yeah. flat lining. And so market. all of this low inventory coupled with then is why we're seeing the median sales price increase. Yep. It, breaking that $300,000 threshold for last month, 
continuing to rise basically year over year, month over month um, is kind of that perfect storm of, you know, it's funny. I talk to a lot of buyers that feel like things are starting to turn Mm -hmm. in the market, um, living in it day to day. Turn it, turn in what way? Turn in like a price perspective Yeah. where I don't know if, I think a lot of that is, and we'll talk about this later with yep. national headlines as far as what's happening with the market from a national perspective. But here in Milwaukee, living in it every day, I'm not seeing any reduction in competition. No. If anything, it seems like competition is rising. Rising. Yeah. Um, offers are becoming more competitive. And because of that, prices are, are still continuing to rise too here in Milwaukee. Yeah. So what, what should we take away from what we're kind of seeing right now? Again, low inventory, just basic economics, supply and demand. That's causing this this medium price rise. You know, what what advice can we give to our, our buyers to start? I think for a buyer, you got to have your numbers really solid of what it is that you're willing to pay for a mortgage, mm-hmm. and have that budget in mind. Um, and if you are truly after home ownership, you have to accept that more likely than not, you're going to have to write over asking, and it's going to be an aggressive offer. Yep. And if that's not what you want to do, then right now honestly might not be the right time for you to buy a home depending on the neighborhood and the location that you're living in right. because that's unfortunately the reality of the situation for buyers is offers that are getting accepted are well over asking price with very soft contingencies yeah the the people i see having success right now is they've come to terms that buying a home is a financial decision in terms of you need to make sure you're within your budget but it's not a, I'm making this investment, so I need to make sure I get the best deal possible because you're just not gonna be successful. You're gonna become incredibly frustrated in today's market where really you're gonna be having these homes again, time and time again here in, you know, Wauwatosa, for example, a lot of listing agents, what's, you know, most homes are selling in the mid 300s. What list price do they select? High twos. 299. 900. Yep. <laughs> it's yep. like, it's, it's just so blatantly obvious exactly what they're doing. And, and for the consumer out there, from the agent's perspective, the goal there is the more people they can get in the home, specifically in their open houses, that's a great way to generate more leads for their business and, you know, make people feel like they have a chance and get, wow, this is what I could afford for 300,000 in Wauwatosa. And it's really doing the customer a disservice, not getting closer to mm-hmm. really where that home should be selling in the mid threes. So Definitely, I'm seeing on the home seller side, I've got to say, you know, some takeaways from this is, you know, just pretty much remove, at least here locally in the Milwaukee greater area, remove any sort of context that we're in a bad real estate market. We're in a unhealthy real estate market from the perspective of sellers pretty much hold the reins in entirety. There's very limited negotiation power from buyers, and we continue to see stronger and stronger offers in terms of price and in contingencies in those offers, timelines like it used to be 45 day transactions. Now it's 30 days to close. Now we're seeing most of the time we're right in between 21 and 24 day closings. Just pick your closing date, mm-hmm. say how long you want to stay there afterwards to go get your next home as well. You know, you're going to have some of the same competition headwinds as well, but as a home seller, it's a really great time to capitalize if you're sitting in that three bedroom, one and a half bath and you need more space and want to capitalize on your equity. So yeah, definitely got all that. We're going to bypass our, our two family space here because in all honesty, we're seeing similar, you know, mm-hmm. trend lines here. Inventory has been, you know, even in an even worse, uh, position. And in all honesty with that, you know, duplex space, we're seeing that FHA is, you know, not necessarily going to happen unless you find something off market and you're probably paying a premium on the price. So, um, overall, that's what we kind of got there. Let's dive into some uh, current events highlights. What are we seeing uh, here anecdotally locally? I know we kind of just hit on that, but maybe give me a, a description of any sort of recent transactions you've had or yeah. offer situations you've uh, had. I think lo- I've worked with a lot of buyers, um, a lot of investors, and a lot of first time home, owner, home owners. Mm-hmm. And I, it's very frustrating. I would feel like for a lot of my buyers that I'm working with, Mm -hmm. because a lot of them have wrote several offers on homes that they love um, and they're getting outbid. Right. And so I think it's difficult right now for buyers and I understand that it's challenging and it's frustrating. Um, Competition is very high though. And so it it really, it comes down to any offer that my buyer is writing. I always advise them to write your best and final Mm -hmm. in that one go, because we're not going to be in this market now in a counter situation typically what's happening is there's so much competition that one of those offers is going to be good enough and it's going to hit the numbers that that seller is looking for where 
if you're holding back, you won't even get the chance to put that best and final forward. Yeah. Um, and so that's really anecdotally what I've been seeing is for buyers, offers that are winning, it's aggressive at ask price and it's a softened contingency typically in the inspection side of things. Yeah, for sure. Um, how are you coaching your clients through ahead of time and what to expect and, and getting them prepared for today's market? I think it all starts with early in the process, mm -hmm. um, helping and educating them about what's happening in the market. Yep. And I always like to bring to showings. I have a good idea with my clients of if it's a home that they're going to write an offer on or not, just after working with them and, and seeing like what they're looking for. And I always like to be prepared, bringing a CMA of recent sales in that area to show them this is listed at this price, yep. but we could see a month ago, a home down the street actually sold for way higher. Mm -hmm. That should probably be our baseline of where we want to start having this conversation. Yep. Um, and I think the numbers don't lie and it allows it to really paint a good picture of what s homes are actually selling for. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still a difficult conversation to have, you yeah. know, because I think I understand for buyers right now, they feel like a lot of them might be feeling they're getting a horrible deal having to write 50, 60 K over. Yeah. And it's like, is that the case or is that a listing that's just way undervalued yeah. intentionally to create and showing up as the, the market expert is the best way to kind of hedge that. And sometimes it's like you say, it's reminding them they're at the showing, but also earlier on in the process and you know, the kickoff when you're really learning about what they want and you get their search ready to go and fully, you know, curated is looking at some of the historicals of mm -hmm. here's what's actually sold. Here's the hot spots of, you know, there's been 60 homes that have sold in your search in the last three months and they've been selling at this price. We used to use the strategy of if you wanted something at 300,000, maybe we set up your search at 325 because maybe something will sit on the market and we'll get it for 300. Like we don't want to miss anything there. It's kind of changed to if you want something at 300,000, we probably want to set our expectations on stuff that's listed at 274.9. Again, another mm -hmm. uh, very much a marketing price, knowing that we're going to need to be competitive and letting them learn and see that search for that first month or so yeah. to really see what the content of the inventory is going to be. What are you seeing here in the market <clears throat> anecdotally, just living in it every day? Yeah, it's like you said, it, it's multiple offers. I, I think the best advice I'm kind of giving to people right now is the old advice of like, go after the thing that has like the sweat equity and like, you know, meat on the bone and things so you can update. Everyone kind of knows that trick. So like those are just as competitive as well. So it's, everyone would love to have that very first home purchase. They'd be to be three bedroom, two bath, but what do you realistically need versus what do you want and being fully clear on what that is? Because the best way that you're going to get all of your wants in a home is by first sacrificing, delaying gratification a little bit capitalizing on this super hot real estate market for the next couple of years, get into something that's comfortable and meets your needs, build that equity one, just through appreciation mm -hmm. probably just going to carry at this point and build up that down payment for the next home, you know, capitalize on, you know, ride the wave because it's here and the low inventory numbers we have shows that it's here to stay. That would probably be like my, my best advice, but anecdotally, yeah, it's, it's high competition. Yeah. We're riding in similar areas. I'm a little bit more in the suburbs. You're a little bit more closer to downtown and it's similar stories. And in some case, you know, you know, dozens of offers, you know, that come across because yeah. it's, you know, a very perfect listing at a great marketing price. Um, moving on to that Milwaukee area, local news. I know you just popped this into DACA, new hotel going in on Brady and Farwell. Yeah. So a 11 story hotel just got accepted and approved to build on Brady and Farwell for anyone that lives here in Milwaukee. That's where the old FedEx used mm -hmm. to be like just east of that Walgreens. Yeah. Uh, a Starbucks used to be there years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I love seeing this for that pocket. I love seeing it for Milwaukee first Heck off. Yeah. yeah. But um, I think that part of Brady specifically has struggled with commercial buildings that have really mm -hmm. been successful there. Right. And I think having a nice hotel that's new is going to attract a lot of people to that part of Brady Street. I don't think there's even a hotel over in that area uh, no, as is I, no i don't believe so either i mean i think if you go a couple blocks south there's some older like studio style hotels yeah. that are half like uh like airbnb slash like studio apartments but yeah nothing like fancy and nice yeah and so i think uh that's where i have a couple of my properties are actually right off brady street a couple yep. blocks over there so selfishly i love that because that to me just shows that milwaukee's investing in that area which mm -hmm. not a surprise um, but I, this is great news for me to hear. Yeah. Somebody needs to buy the building across the street where that Starbucks used to be because yes. maybe just reopen the Starbucks. <laughs> yeah. It could be us. At this point, I love, I'm, I actually lived right on the corner of Brady and Farwell when I first moved here. 
and just awesome area. I know that uh, I think last year was the first year it came back, but it's coming back this year as well. Uh, Brady Street Fest mm -hmm. is uh, July 29th this year, same weekend as the uh, – uh, the you know craft beer festival which is down in lakefront that's like one of the best days in milwaukee is go down in the afternoon at two o'clock have some craft beers and then you know trudge your way up brady the hill street. come over the brady street bridge that goes over link memorial drive and you know yep. just make, make your, your way, way down. right down brady street yeah. so that's going to be an awesome spot and honestly you can walk to Summerfest grounds from that location too so i'm sure that's going to do well um here's something i dropped in here not news I thought it was interesting. I, I got it from a newsletter uh, from Bigger Pockets, so I want to do a deep dive on. Uh, they had pulled up inbound and outbound reason for moving, as well as age ranges, and you're able to actually look down to the state. So, state of Wisconsin, primary reason for moving. This is uh, organized not in order any sort of fashion in terms of like percentages, but the number one imbalance in terms of why people are leaving Wisconsin and not replacing the inventory or, or replacing themselves is retirement. Makes a lot of sense. A lot of people here in the state of Wisconsin love the snowbird. And I think we've probably seen, especially with, you know, everyone says, you know, the baby boomer, boomer kind of generation, um, probably starting to move towards full-time snowbirding, moving out of the state of Wisconsin <laughs> and avoiding these winters slash uh, what last week we had like, you know, we had snow come in, it was 30 degrees uh, a few days after it was 80 degrees. So makes a lot of sense. A lot of people actually coming in for health reasons and not sure necessarily what that would be. But I think the biggest ones I want to call out are family and job. Those are, you know, big uh, increases. So you have people coming in due to family reasons. Mm -hmm. You know, usually I think that probably would be whether it's school district, maybe it's because they can afford a bigger house because the size of the family's growing. But this is also jobs. We're seeing 40% of people coming into Wisconsin at, as opposed to 34% of people leaving Wisconsin due to job reasons. We've got more people finding job and employment here, which is always a good indicator of somebody coming into the state. Yeah, I'm looking at this and uh, I like how they have this set up where mm -hmm. they have the inbound percentage versus the outbound percentage. And uh, no shocker, a lot more people for retirement reasons are leaving to retire than coming to Wisconsin to retire. <laughs> yeah. um, but seeing the job one is nice, knowing that there's more people coming in mm -hmm. to Wisconsin for jobs and leaving to go jobs elsewhere. And then family, it looks like it's the other, the largest one actually for inbound mm -hmm. percentage of people moving. Um, and there's about a 10% discrepancy between people coming in yep. to move because of family and a, at 40% and 30% moving away because of family. Um, That's right. And so... Yeah, I, I mean, I, wouldn't, I don't think I would want to move here for retirement. You know? No, no, I don't, I don't blame not. the 21% yeah. of people that are moving away. I, and I think the main thing I want to say is, like, how can we relate this to some of this, <clears throat> some of the actual hard stats that we just went through in our local MLS? We actually get to age ranges is down here below in the dock, and the demographic that's coming in is heavily weighted towards essentially people under 44% of you know people coming into the state of wisconsin that's working age you know getting job related family related but what we know is that's also that key household formation years mm -hmm. one of the main things that's driving us and i know we can have a chart here in a second that mentions what uh the national median price drop austin median price drop but then milwaukee increasing we actually got a little call out there like i think a big part of this reason why we just are not slowing down here our market is this demographic information of there's more people coming into the state of Wisconsin that are in that the you know pure golden like millennial home buyer age mm -hmm. that have not actually bought homes they've delayed for a variety of reasons whether it was they went and got employment right after the great recession in 2008 2009 or you know were more experience driven as opposed to material driven we've got a lot of people that are ready to buy and now there's just no inventory because nobody's been building. Yep. So I just thought this was a cool chart to kind of pull up and, and, and walk through and just maybe give some like anecdotal or maybe more qualitative of what yeah. the heck's going on in our market. It's interesting. For sure. Um, going to like the national landscape. So I know last time we talked about uh, SVB. Uh, I know you got some notes there because I don't yeah. follow this as closely <laughs> as you do. So Yeah, so I think last time we did this, there was the Silicon Valley Bank collapse, massive uh, bank run that ensued. And, uh, you know, we did not see as much of a fallout as that, as maybe what I was expecting, maybe what everyone in the world was expecting, which is good. Uh, because a fallout from that would mean a very bad thing for our, our, for our economy. Um, and it's kind of been something that people have almost forgotten about, maybe. I don't know. Um, so that's great. Mm -hmm. 
I have noticed an increase in the number of bank deposits as well, too. When SVB collapsed, the number of bank deposits plummeted rapidly. People kind of having that fear mindset of the banks are all collapsing. Let's take our money out. And bank deposits have actually increased since then. Um, so it seems like things are in a healthier spot for banks. Sure. And we're not seeing quite as much of like a ripple effect from this as I expected. Yeah, I got to assume it's based on the reaction of the Fed and everybody else. And was like, yeah, we're coming in. FDIC insurance is good to go. If not even exceeding that amount. Right. Like we're fine. Let's just throw more money at it. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great. Got, got to love that. Um, <clears throat> Like we just alluded to a second ago, we got some Redfin data, you mm -hmm. know, in an article you read through. Walk me through kind of high level of what was going on there. Yeah, so this is an article by Redfin. Um, title is Home Prices Fell 3% in March, year over year, biggest annual drop in over a decade. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it's, it's... It's crash. It's here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all happening. Uh, it's funny just reading the national headlines. We talk about this a lot reading the national headlines compared to what we just saw here locally, where we saw home prices increase, was it 7% yep, year over eight. year? Yep. And then compared to the national average decline of 3%, and just that's a, a good 10% spread. spread right there. Mm -hmm. um, but again, where most of the transactions are happening, where most of the volume is, is happening is going to be along the coasts in New York, California, Florida. Yep. Um, so whatever's happening in those markets is going to have a way bigger impact than a market like Milwaukee. Obviously we're important, you know, we're the yeah. best city in the US, but of course. Not, yeah. not as much of a pull from a national perspective. And so the key cities that are really driving this down, Boise's down 15%, Austin down 13, Sacramento down 11, San Jose down 10, Oakland down nine. But if I scroll down on this, <laughs> this is pretty interesting actually. So this is a screenshot that they included in here, yeah. comparing median sales prices of a national level and then including Austin, Boise, and then the third city they included was Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Let's go. Which uh, <laughs> is seeing us up there with Austin and Boise for a good reason is great. But just looking at the national sales, median sales prices for these four different uh, indicators. We said it here first. Milwaukee is the next hot market. Better get in before it's uh, too late because we're the next Austin. <sighs> Milwaukee's the next Austin. Dated April 21st, 2023. Milwaukee for sure is the next market to take off. You heard it here. <laughs> well, what I love seeing these four trend lines on top of each other, National Austin, Boise, and Milwaukee, is everyone else had a massive spike in home prices in 2021. Mm -hmm. um, significant, like up to 40% in Boise and Austin. Real healthy. Almost yep. a 25% spike nationally. In Milwaukee, we never saw that. We mm -hmm. saw about 11% spike. Mm -hmm. But Milwaukee has just been steady eddy compared to these other markets where you're seeing a significant increase and now kind of a giant pullback from them. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's pretty interesting. This really and, caught my and, eye. And, and honestly, like these are the cities that have, you know, probably attracted most of the attention. Like I even have some anecdotes of some contractors I know from the Iowa area that just drive down to Florida, drive down to Texas, and they do work there on punch lists and construction projects just to get those done instead of working on homes in the Midwest area because they can get paid way more down there just for working like they'll just stay in a hotel, they'll work for a few weekends, knock out punch lists, and they'll come back and like no one's really focused on building in the Midwest because the prices aren't as high as, you know, obviously like there's larger spreads, larger profits to be made in some of these bigger metro areas that have all the tech industry mm -hmm. and everything coming in, even though we have a huge need for it here. So super interesting to see yeah. that and, you know, to kind of hit on like, you know, I guess I'd say almost discrediting this, you know, uh, fear tactic, you know, from all the news lines, you know, whenever you see a oh, 3% drop, you know, in home prices year over year, home prices are going up. Technically, if you look on a month over month basis, uh, 380,000 nationally last month versus 400,000 uh, this month in the month of March. So prices are going to go up. Yes, they're down, you know, relative to a lot to a year ago. Most people did not buy their home in the last 12 months. You know, most people have owned it longer. So like if you own your home, yeah, like you're, you're probably going to be in a good spot. You mm -hmm. know, reach out to your agent, get yourself an updated equity review. Yeah. If you bought in the last year, you might need to wait, you know, let's call it uh, six months, uh, six to 12 months here and you'll be back in a good position overall. So um, as long as nothing too crazy goes on with inventory or just, uh, you know, unforeseen black swan event. Let's see. Otherwise, I guess, you know, diving into some of the national topics that we have, I see, it, you know, inventory, I feel like we've kind of hit on the local level. 
I do want to pull that up, but why don't you go into uh, inflation, what's going on? I feel like everyone's forgotten about inflation yeah. since the last couple of big events that came up. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, well, inflation, again, the Fed's goal is to get that down to 2%. We saw it at 5% this last month, which is a pretty significant drop from the 8% before. So that's great news that we're seeing inflation get back to where we want it to be. But if we look into this a bit more, um, the indicators that I think are a little bit more important are going to be your housing and shelter is what they call it the yep. inflation based on shelter um and if we look at that that's actually at an eight percent um increase mm -hmm. so it's still sticky. rising it's yeah. still sticky yeah. and that's typically going to be one of the larger costs associated with people's everyday life is the cost of their mortgage mm -hmm. or their apartment um so we're not really seeing much of a change or a pullback with uh, that portion of it of um of inflation but i'm excited about that energy Energy is going down. There we go. Down 7%. I love that. But I yeah. don't feel like that here with We Energies, but. Yeah, well. it's, it's good to see. Yeah, again, all this stuff and, you know, with, you know, energy and all that kind of stuff kind of coming down that that helps with some of the, you know, transportation costs and looking at some of these, uh, you know, things that aren't on the service side, which includes shelter used cars and trucks, I feel like is something that a lot of people have been talking about mm -hmm. of, you know, finally, they're starting to get under control with some of the the new, you know, vehicles coming in getting more supply. Wouldn't it be great if we had a little bit more supply to get things under control ourselves? Speaking of which, as we kind of look at national inventory in March, 560,000 homes uh, available in the month of March versus well, we got here 350,000 homes available a year ago. So yeah, it's a it's a healthy increase in terms mm -hmm. of active listings available. But again, we've we've spoken to it before. Historically, we, it's still significant. Historically, low. Mark 2020 934,000 listings, roughly down 40 to 50%, just ballpark in that. Mm -hmm. Like we've seen in the months of supply, there's half as many homes that should be out there, especially as you look for population growth, and especially in some of these areas that are still seeing increased demand, kind of like our, our local area here in Milwaukee. Otherwise, we got, uh, you know, something everybody, everybody loves tracking. I feel like it, it's everyone's getting used to it. Interest rates. Just going through real quick, as of today, 21st of April from Mortgage News Daily, 30-year fixed, we're sitting around a 6.66%. We've just seen this pretty much just bounce right between 6% and 7% for the last few months. We actually just got an email today from, uh, you know, Robbie Refkin uh, in terms of a, a newsletter to say, like, people are getting used to 6%. And I'll say, as we look forward, like, this is probably, like, the only thing if we relate it back to our, our customers, as we get to the tail end of this year, there's going to be way more sellers who bought within the twelve last 12 to 16 months are going to be more comfortable with if they bought a home and they need to relocate or they bought a home and they realize it's too small and not a perfect fit, they bought at six to 7% interest rates. They're not dealing with that same lock-in effect that some of these sellers are that bought between 2020 and the middle of, you know, 2020, uh, two, we might actually see a lot of those sellers re-enter the market. However, that's kind of like net neutral of every time a home seller comes to the market, usually that's a home buyer as well. And, Again, this kind of goes back to we still just need home build, new home building. 15-year mm -hmm. rate is sitting around like a 6.04. Everyone's getting getting used to these rates. What are the biggest things that you're hearing from customers in terms of uh, interest rates? What's what's the general thought process right now? It, it's still difficult, I would say, for buyers because we know what they were four years ago, and we know what they are now. And mm -hmm. it's a tough pill to swallow just to know that if you were to buy four years ago, what that would mean for you from a monthly payment perspective. Mm -hmm. But I do feel like, yeah, Robert Refkin was on Squawk Box talking about how more or less buyers have typically accepted that 6% is the new interest rate. And, you know, I think it all goes back to why is it that you're looking for a home in the first place? Yep. And it, typically it's going to be like a, you're, you're growing your family. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a first home. Maybe you're downsizing a new job, mm -hmm. but that's what matters. And that's, what's important to keep in mind as a buyer is the interest rate obviously is important. You need to make a decision that fits your budget, mm -hmm. but keep remembering why it is that you're buying a home in the first place. Cause For that's sure. more important than what a percentage is. And, and I feel like it's been too incredibly easy. And like the friction point right now is that people used to be okay with like, Hey, me and my girlfriend, we're going to go buy a house, but we're going to rent it out to our buddy and he's going to get like the guest room in the basement and we're going to charge him rent and it's going to make it affordable. But then once we have our first kid, we kick him out mm -hmm. and it's like, it slows down household, household formation a little bit, but like we know that demand's still there, but like 
there's some of that like delayed gratification sacrifice that it's like everyone's gotten so used to, oh, we just as a couple can just buy any house that we want because it's a two and a half percent interest rate and it's just free money. Those times have changed, but mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to, you know, swallow that pill where, you know, we, we're in a great country where a lot of people, it's like more than 65% of all households own their home. And it's like, that's a great stat. And it's more normal than not that people do. But sometimes we take it for granted when you compare us to other countries or whatever else might be. And that's kind of my thought is, you know, how can you get creative? Because it's definitely good to be in this real estate market and capture some of this. But how can you find strategies to offset that living cost you have each month because of interest rates? Mm -hmm. Everyone else is dealing with the same problem. How can you get more creative to, to, be yep. a, to have a solution for it and be yep. the solution? And don't let an interest rate stop you from the value of lifelong real estate ownership. Yeah. You know, and obviously like it, it hurts knowing that rates were what they were, but if it fits your budget, don't let that deter you from capturing the value of home ownership. Absolutely. Let's see. So let's take a quick pause here, stretch my back out, take a sip of uh, my water here. Uh, what are the national headlines? Are you looking for information on Ask us in the comments below. We want to take, give you guys our take on what's going on in the current events. What are some data lines you're seeing? What's the scariest article you can pull up? And uh, we want to try to give you our response to it. Otherwise, I mean, now we've kind of wrapped all that up. What's new? Anything interesting uh, you got to do this uh, this last month? Uh, yeah, so I was actually out in Park City for a ski and golf <laughs> trip. Okay. Played about 54 holes of golf, uh, two days of skiing. There you go. Uh, I kept on saying that you're in Salt Lake City to people, so same thing? Uh, we would golf in Salt Lake City, okay. stayed in Park City. Okay, it was like go. 40 minutes away, so okay. same thing, same, Very same, cool. but different. Uh, but my golf clubs didn't make it back with me. <laughs> Ended up driving back to Midway last night. Uh, they basically got, they fell out of a baggage cart, got ran over several times, and then dragged behind a cart. Uh, so shout out Southwest <laughs> for destroying my golf clubs. Um, it was pretty bad. It looked like a bear attacked my, my bag, and <laughs> the, the wedges were literally grounded down. Like someone took it to a grinder. But they, I'm looking for a new wedge. Uh, the wedges are okay. The okay. iron's not so much. But um, yeah. I've got uh, – they, they reimbursed me for the full cost of everything. So truly shout out Southwest for doing what's right and, and making me whole with, with the major mess up that they did. They reimburse your gas to get down there too? The uh, $100 fly voucher. Okay, there with you go. With my forerunner at 14 miles a gallon. I don't know if that checks out, but it's Kelsey something. got a, a $75 one just to go from Tosa to Milwaukee. So I think they kind of wow. shorted you on that uh, voucher there. Yeah, <laughs> I, I might need to bring Kelsey in with me to, to fight this a little bit. There you go. How about you? What's been new with you? Uh, took a couple trips. Made our way down to Houston, see a buddy that uh, he moved down there about five years ago. Never had the chance to go down there, so we got to experience uh, a couple different things. Uh, got to see a rugby match. You know, it's nice. one of the things I do in my free time, so we got to see an MLR rugby match. Got to do a crawfish boil, oh, which is fun. great. You know, second one of those I've got to do with the sausage, the potatoes, all that good stuff. You just pour it out on the table? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's in a bowl, but then you just you know crank off the heads, you know, slurp it down, all that good stuff. Uh, we checked out an open house when I was down there, which is fun. Um, it's crazy to see the difference in uh, real estate uh, there versus here. Pretty much every single home, even like the really nice big homes, have like accessory dwelling units and like casitas in the back. Like pretty much every single place has a uh, like, you know two homes on one wow. lot, but a lot of them are like nanny's quarters or everything mm. else. You know, depending on the area that you're in, but. Got to do that. Went down to Austin for a little work retreat. Yep. Got some work done, some planning done. We did a broker open and uh, checked out Austin uh, real estate, kind of in the South Congress area. So that was an awesome trip as well. A little bit of relaxation. Got a couple offers uh, accepted for some clients, which is always Congrats. great when you're on a Love vacation. That. And it feels like money is just uh, coming uh, freely after all the work that you've probably put in the last three months before then. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's all that we've been up to. Nice. Nice. Well, a lot of Texas time for you, it sounds like. Yeah, it's uh, it's nice down there. It was actually, for a couple of days, it was actually nicer in Milwaukee than it was in Texas. Uh. You know, we hit the 80s here in Milwaukee, but, you know, that's the way it, way it goes, I suppose. But, well, to wrap this all up here, if you found value in the information we just covered here for the Milwaukee area with some national context, please subscribe, hit that bell for uh, notification button. If you're listening to us in podcast form, you know, definitely subscribe download it. That's how we know that you're loving the content and leave us a review. Um, definitely know, you know, that's going to give you information on when we post our next market update, as well as any other content that might help you with your real estate decisions in the future. Also give us a thumbs up, comment below. We want to know uh, that you're listening and that what details you want in the future. Thanks again. And we'll be back again next month with your Milwaukee market update. Thanks everyone.